Please come up. Did you get your? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks Jan for your generous introduction. Um, and thanks uh, to Solidaridad and uh, Kurdistan for organizing this. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so I think I'm going to divide my talk into three main parts. Um, first, I want to locate the question of Kurdish uh, struggle in Iran for recognition and political rights in the broader question of um, so-called uh, the, Kurdish, the Kurdish question, which is a problematic description, but nonetheless it's very common in the media and as well as academic circles. Then I'm going to through, um, kind of an, provide an overview of the evolution of Kurdish uh, movements in Iranian Kurdistan from early 20th century, but with a focus on um, um, mid 20th century and post revolutionary period, which will, which will be the, the bulk of my talk, um, actually. And at the end, I try to reflect a little bit on potential lines of development um, in, um, in the struggle of um, Kurdish people in Iran for uh, right of self determination. <coughs> Can you try to talk slowly and distinctly? All oh, right, you can know Kurdish, but not English. <laughs> okay, that, that, that's going to be a challenge. I'll try. Thank you. So, uh, to understand uh, the so-called Kurdish question, uh, we need to understand what it was like before the rise of modern, um, singular, uh, centralized nation states in, in the region, in the Middle East. And that's something not everybody is necessarily aware of, especially outside um, Kurdish movement, or those who are interested in Kurdish uh, politics and history. So up to the late 19th century, um, what is now called Middle East, really, was divided between two um, empires, the Iranian Empire, the Qajar monarchy, and the Ottoman Empire, which was the larger of the two. Now, like all pre-modern empires, these were highly decentralized states. There was no center, as we know today, in modern nation-state. These were large uh, empires which had no actually fixed territorial boundaries. Most pre-modern empires defined and understood themselves as universal empires, in the sense that they had an aspiration to become, you know, cover the entire world. So in that sense, they were not even territorial in the way we understand modern states to be. And precisely because of that, and because there was a very low level of technological and administrative development, there could not be a central state which could directly rule the entire region. For this reason, all these empires had basically what you could describe as a confederal system in which local um, ruling classes and ruling elites, whether landlords or tribal leaders and so on, they had very high level of autonomy in the region they ruled. So there was a kind of unwritten agreement between these local elites and the ruling um, empire or, or dynasty. And the deal was this, that they, they had high level of autonomy in their region, in return for providing troops and certain amount of tax for the for the for the um, for the for the empire in the center, whether in, in Istanbul or in Tehran. Now, this meant that the Kurdish uh, region was highly autonomous, although fragmented, um, in in that period. So you had these so-called emirates or principalities, you know, Soran, Baban, or Botan, and so on. These were small, if you like, in a way, mini-states, which um, were highly autonomous in their region. And they were even more autonomous than, say, the, the principalities in the Balkan or in the Arab parts of the Ottoman Empire, because they were on the boundaries between the Iranian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. So they could basically play off the two empires against each other and extract more and more concession from from the empire in terms of their uh, autonomy. Now this is very important because Ottoman Empire is the last empire of the modern times which collapsed very recently, you know, 1918, it's not very long ago. This meant that the Kurdish Emirates and the Kurdish um, local um, rulers 
had a very strong sense of autonomy, which was suddenly uh, taken away from them by the rising nation states of Turkey and Iran. Now, what happened is that these states were no longer understanding themselves as a multicultural, multi-ethnic, um, multi-faith state. They tried to build a very homogeneous, internally um, a homogeneous state in which one particular culture and language, in the case of Turkey, Turkish, in the case of Iran, Persian, became the defining feature of the new state. So the new political language, the ideology, the education, the culture, everything was reorganized around these two particular identities. And this immediately meant that the other identities which existed obviously before that, collective identities I mean, suddenly were relegated politically but also culturally. Now what is interesting here is that this process itself was a reaction by these states or empires to the European pressure of you know, grow, you know, imperial and colonial uh, pressure by Britain, by France, by Russia and so on. So these states were reorganizing themselves along a nation-state line against the West, and within themselves the existing uh, cultural and ethnic communities were reacting to this by trying to create their own uh, nationalist movements. So you said, basically you have a, a chain of reaction, one to the West and one to the local states, which were trying to reorganize themselves along the centralized territorial state which we have. So this is really the origins of the so-called Kurdish question, because a, lot, a high level of autonomy of the Kurdish regions suddenly was expropriated, if you like, taken away by these rising states, and of course there was a reaction to this. And this reaction um, immediately could use the discourse of nationalism, which already existed in Europe from the French Revolution onwards. But it also existed in these states themselves, so you had Persian or Iranian and Turkish nationalists, the Young Turks, you know, the, um, the Iranian intelligentsia of the early 20th century, they themselves were using a nationalist language, which the Kurdish uh, movements or people, or intellectuals, could also immediately copy the same thing, but in a Kurdish accent, if you like. So from here on, you have from early, late 19th century, early 20th century, you have the rise of so-called Kurdish question, um, so there is a demand uh, for recognition in terms of cultural distinctiveness, but also for political rights uh, within these states. Um, the nature of this uh, demand was different in different times and different places. It ranged from independence to, um, to autonomy to you know, all, all sorts of right of self-determination. There are different formula as to how the Kurdish... Um, you know, semi-colonial situation could be, could be dealt with. Um, now, before going on into the, the empirical details, I want to mention two things, because these, uh, these dynamics are central to understanding the nature of Kurdish politics over the last century or so. One is that because um, Kurdistan was, you know, after the end of First World War, divided into four parts, you know, um, Turkey, Iran, uh, Iraq, and Syria, it's, it's one of the few, if not the only, national movement in the world where you have four interrelated but politically fragmented parts. Now, this has two implications. One, um, if you like, enabling, it's a positive thing, and one is restraining and constricting. Uh, i.e. it's a problem. The enabling thing is that any movement or any, um, any advance, any achievement in one of these parts immediately has implication for the other parts. So for example, if, um, if there was a Kurdish autonomy, let's say in Iraq in the 1970s, that has a positive impact for Iranian Kurds because they can you know, um, rely and draw on those resources, get inspiration, uh, have organizational techniques, uh, cadres of, uh, you know, activists move between the different parts, 
And this provides different parts with resources from the other parts. Um, in early post-revolutionary Iran, for example, Kurdish opposition in Iraq uh, were relying on the so-called liberated zones within Iranian Kurdistan to get trained, to um, um, receive resources, logistical, and so on and so forth, for their own struggle against the Iraqi state and so on. So there is, a, therefore, a positive dimension to this fragmentation. But there is also a negative dimension, one is, which is um, these states, these four states which dominate the Kurdish uh, nation, um, have their own rivalries among themselves. So the Kurdish movement can rely on these gaps and tensions between them in order to advance its project. But they also are part of a much larger global arrangement, of course. So let's say Iraq in the 70s and 60s was part of the Eastern Bloc, close to the Soviet Union, um, whereas Iran and Turkey were you know, close to the West, Turkey part of a member of NATO. So whatever their internal um, connections, in the last analysis, their policies towards the Kurdish movement is also decided to a large extent by their location in the global uh, order, um, which during the Cold War was obviously, there were two sides, so one could guess how it would go, but in, at the moment we don't have that um, bipolarity, if you like, and um, there is a high level of um, self-assertion, or if you like, autonomy by the regional states vis-a-vis -vis Kurdish movement. Uh, and they, uh, in the absence of um, United States, you know, desire or ability to actually lead as it did before, uh, states like Turkey or Iran can actually have you know, regional uh, projects. Uh, sometimes they defy um, United States or Western powers, um, and therefore they, they can much more aggressively uh, pursue their, their uh, project. And the Kurdish movement, being obviously a non-state actor, is, doesn't have anything close to the resources which these states have. The other element, which is very crucial in understanding the you know, evolution and up and down of the Kurdish movement historically, is uh, the, you know, basically class structure or the level of uh, modernization and capitalist development in the region. So wherever you have a more um, aggressive level of capitalist development, you have actually stronger national consciousness and national movement. And this is very important, for example, in Iran, after the land reforms by the Shah in the uh, early 1960s, you suddenly have a very different kind of uh, national movement in which it's no longer simply led by the landlords or this tribal uh, chief or this sheikh and so on. You have a much more broader um, mass basis for, um, for Kurdish national project, basically. Um, but it also has implication in terms of um, the ideological language of different wings of Kurdish movement. So historically you have right and left or nationalist and you know, socialist uh, wings of this movement which sometimes have come to, into conflict as well as I will come to. So this is the broader, like, if you like, the historical international context of so-called Kurdish question. But in, now I want to move to the Iranian case very specifically, given that this is um, the subject. I would need a, a watch to make sure I'm not going over line. Can, can somebody borrow a name here? Yes, thank you. you when you're Oh yeah, oh great, sorry, thanks. I'll see that. Yeah, that's good. So um, basically in Iran, as you, most of you probably know, um, we had constitutional revolution in 1906. So constitutional revolution was really the first expression of Iranian nationalism uh, in the sense that the Iranian uh, merchant class, intellectuals, but also radicals who had immigrated to Russia, uh, working in um, oil industry in Baku and so elsewhere, they were exposed to the Bolshevik ideology and communism and so on. So these groups came together into a very... Um, unusual alliance against the monarchy because monarchy was giving a lot of 
concessions to the um, Russian and British uh, empires. But in order to do that, they, they began to use a nationalist language. They were referring to the nation, that the nation has an interest, it's different from the, uh, the Shah's interest or the monarchy and so on. And the revolution itself uh, had some sort of recognition of the fact that Iran was a plural society. And there were different cultures and languages and so on. So they talked about so-called you know, uh, provincial societies, Anjuman Haivalayati in Farsi and so on. So this was like a, some sort of limited recognition of the fact that Iran was not, you know, didn't exist before in the way these people wanted to reconstruct it. But as we know, uh, the Constitutional Revolution in a way did not succeed. Russia intervened and there was a period of civil war. <coughs> But what happened and was really crucial was that ar around the same time, First World War happened, um, and Iran became the scene for um, inter-imperial conflict between Russia and Britain and so on. And very shortly afterwards, we had Russian Revolution of 1917. And, um, you know, Bolsheviks actually landed in Iran, in Caspian region. You had the Socialist Republic in Gilan and so on. Now, I'm saying this because... This, move, this development immediately alarmed the Iranian ruling elites, uh, so-called bazaar, but also the uh, clergy, the Shia clergy and so on. And they were afraid of a similar situation in Iran, some sort of you know, um, socialist revolution and so on. So even though these people before were anti-establishment uh, and they were um, trying to have some sort of liberal state, because of the fear they had from the left, uh, they agreed that they need a strong man to save them, but they described it as Iran, from uh, anarchy and, uh, and so on, and chaos. This strong man was Reza Khan, who subsequently became the Shah of Iran, and um, Reza Shah began what we understand to be the process of um, the first attempt at modern, modernizing Iran along a nation-state uh, um, form. And he was very much in, inspired by Ataturk in Turkey. So they had the similar vision that uh, these countries have to be reorganized around one flag, one nation, one language. Um, and this was in force, uh, imposed via violence, um, you know, security and army establishment and so on, but also through through education, through um, uh, establishing modern schools and colleges and universities and so on. And, so on. and here you have the beginning of the first uh, reactions and resistance from, uh, from all, all parts of Iranian uh, non-Persian speaking communities, but especially in Kurdistan. Um, you know, with Simco revolt in the northwest, uh, northern part of Kurdistan and so on. So uh, these were all uh, violently suppressed uh, up to Second World War uh, when Iran was uh, occupied by the Allies, Soviet Union in the north and the Britain in the south. And this occupation actually opened up the political space in Iran. Uh, actually, even today, uh, 1941 to 1945 is considered, actually until 1953, the coup. One of the most... Um, open and liberal uh, period in Iranian history. And you remember I mentioned the global and international dimension of Kurdish movement? So you have here a very clear example how an external situation creates a space for Kurdish movement to you know, express itself. And this, was, um, this took place in the form of uh, Kurdistan Republic in 1945-46 in the city of Mahabad, um, and this is the first modern uh, instance of basically Kurdish statehood of, of some form. But this lasted only for 11 months because Soviet Union uh, did not have nuclear weapon at the time. United States threatened uh, Soviet Union with nuclear um, attack unless it left Iran. So, Soviet army left and uh, the central state attacked um, Azerbaijan Republic, but also Kurdish 
uh, Kurdistan Republic, and they were overthrown. Um, the leader of Kurdistan Republic, Bazi Muhammad, and his um, key ministers were, uh, were, were executed and so on. But this period also had the, uh, you had the first modern political organization in Kurdistan of Iran, the Kurdistan Democratic Party, which was, um, came out of the Society for the Revival of Kurdish uh, People, or Kurdistan, the Komalej Rekaf. And it's really significant because uh, you had the first modern political party uh, in, in the region, in uh, Iranian Kurdistan, and this party kind of culture and party politics therefore has a very deep root uh, in Kurdish politics generally, but especially in Iranian Kurdistan. So from collapse of the Kurdistan Republic until the Iranian Revolution, you have a period of, um, if you like, low-profile, uh, low-intensity int struggle um, by Kurdish um, activists and political leadership. Many of them were arrested by the Shah, many of them managed to cross the border to go to Iraq, where the Kurdish movement had a uh, certain level of success and autonomy and so on. Um, so, I think the, during this period, two important things happen. One is that um, the, the movement in Iraqi Kurdistan, led by uh, Mullah Mustafa Barzani, um, left a quite negative impact on the intelligentsia of the Iranian Kurdistan in the sense in which it collaborated with the Iranian state against uh, the remnants of the KDPI and so on. And there was a shift, if you like, to the left within the KDPI. Uh, parts of it were uh, disillusioned with this situation. But more importantly, um, the land reforms which I refer to happened in the 1960s. And land reform basically destroyed the social basis of Kurdish tribal class, as well as landed class. And with the destruction of these two social classes, you had a perfect, um, maybe not so perfect, but a very conducive environment for the rise of um, both uh, kind of more... more um, mass-based uh, Kurdish nationalist project, but also radical left organizations which had a socialist agenda, not simply a national agenda. This was also uh, you know, supported by the experience of the 1953 coup, when the pro-Soviet Stalinist to the party failed to defend the national government of Mohammad Mossadegh. Um, and in the meantime, Chinese Revolution, Cuban, Cuban Revolution, and so on, Third World Revolutions took place, and uh, especially Chinese Revolution showed that there is a non-Soviet way of doing socialist politics and so on. So a group of um, Kurdish intellectuals of Iran uh, who were against uh, the Soviet experience uh, and its Iranian version became attracted to these new forms of uh, non-Stalinist form of socialism. But because they were in Kurdistan, they had to combine this project with a Kurdish nationalist agenda as well. So here is, you have the beginning of the formation of what became Komala later, which is the left radical wing of Kurdish movement, if you like, from you know, mid-60s onwards. And after revolution, it, it expressed itself in, in organizational terms. And this is important because from then on, from 1979 onwards, up to very moment, you have basically two broad fronts or tendencies within Kurdish movement in Iran. One is left socialist, one is more liberal nationalist. Uh, and at times, these two wings actually have fought each other, which has had disastrous uh, consequences for Kurdish movement, especially in the early 80s. There was a bloody uh, conflict between KDPI and, and Komala. Um, so, in the early post-revolutionary period, therefore, these two wings had, for a period of time, a kind of um, unspoken alliance against the Islamic Republic, which was trying to uh, impose its authority on Kurdistan uh, through a, a, you know, a very violent uh, war, war for which 
you know, Khomeini famously issued the Jihad decree in 1980, summer of 1980 or 1979, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Um, so, Kurdistan was the last part of Iran to fully be controlled by the Islamic Republic. So, the last Kurdish town which was captured by the uh, central state was Bukhan in 1982, I believe. But Kurdish countryside, the rural areas, were still controlled by Peshmerga forces for several years to come. Um, and again, here you see another example of how international um, relations and international environment creates a particular opportunity for Kurdish movement. Because Iran-Iraq war starts in 1980, so Iran supports anti Iraqi opposition groups, including the Kurdish groups, and of course Iraq supports anti-Iranian groups, including the Kurdish groups. So during this period, the Kurdish movement in Iran has logistical support of Iraqi government, uh, but it also has close connections with um, Iraqi Kurdish movement, although more um, secretly, because otherwise Ba'ath regime would uh, would not, you know, give them the support it was giving them. So the moment this war ends in 1988, uh, these two states stop supporting each other's opposition. And from then, armed struggle in Iranian Kurdistan is no longer feasible. There is no uh, supply line, uh, there is no, you know, significant uh, military support and so on. So the military aspect of the movement dies down to a great extent. So main Kurdish parties retreat into uh, Iraqi Kurdistan uh, and continue their, um, if you like, media operation through radios, um, publications and so on, and more recently through satellite TV. But th their armed wings are uh, no longer operating inside Iranian Kurdistan. Um, and because of that, because the Kurdish parties are cut off from their organic environment in, inside society in Kurdistan, you have a period of confusion, internal uh, disagreements, crisis, leadership competition, ideological problems and so on. So you have a series of splits within these groups. Um, uh, and this obviously undermines the Kurdish uh, political parties' power to, to do politics the way they wanted. On top of this, there comes another international event, which was beyond Kurdish movement's uh, control, if you like, in Iran, which was the, um, the first so-called first Gulf War of 1991, when Iraq invades Kuwait and then uh, a US-led coalition ejects it and... Um, in the humanitarian um, catastrophe which follows this, uh, there is no fly zone over the northern part of Iraq, in Iraqi Kurdistan, and you have the rise, the formation of what we now know as Kurdistan Regional Government, KRG. So, this was simultaneously a positive thing because you had a you know, region which was not under central state's control and it was able to run itself and so on. But this KRG area had to rely on its relations with Iran and Turkey in order to survive in economic terms, but also in some ways in diplomatic terms. And this meant that KRG, up to this very day, has to give certain concessions to the Iranian <coughs> states vis-à-vis -vis, uh, in relation to Kurdish opposition within Iran. So this, in a way, further constrained Kurdish movements in Iran to um, you know, pursue its struggle, because if they did, let's say, launch armed struggle, Iran would cut its connections or its help for the KRG, or even intervene militarily, and it has done it uh, several times. So suddenly Kurdish parties were 